genocide. And a holocaust <laughs> against the most defenseless in our society, you know. Um, and, and, and what, if we look at the problems in our society, abortion is one of the big factors in that. We've got a demographic problem in Western Europe. Like, overpopulation. what? Overpopulation? No, I'm talking about the fact that we haven't got population replacement. Oh, okay. So we're at, we're, we're, we're low looking. Low birth rates. Low birth rates, yeah. And uh, that's a lot of it. A lot of it is to do with contraception and abortion. Yeah. You know? And so if you can't, if you can't replace your population naturally, what are your options? If you, if you, if you choose death, you choose to kill your own born, then that means your options are you either allow your population to collapse like Japan's choosing to do and replace everybody with machines you or, or you do what Germany and, and Britain are doing and import population to replace the population that you're not giving yourself and then the question becomes well if you're importing population are they are they <clears throat> Are they coming from a place where they agree with the values that built your society or not? And, and what we've done in the West is we've imported population that, that a, a good chunk of it does not agree with the Judeo-Christian values that built Western civilization in the way that it did. But this is why I count you. I would say society as a whole, like our liberal society, it's not that necessarily against Judeo-Christian ethics. It's more, we've, at, at a time right now, we've said there's more importance in women's rights but rather than our, the sort of Judeo-Christian ethics. You know, we sort of live in a time where we've sacrificed a bit of, you know, some, some moral sense we have for the greater good, supposed greater good for more autonomy to women. You know? Yeah, but, but what, 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 what's happened is that the religion of the self is now the religion of the West. So what I mean by that is that when, because of World War I and World War II, we decided that we didn't want to organize society along the basis of national identity. Yeah, I, I actually listened to your speech about this. It was actually really interesting. Yeah. So, so now what we have is we're trying to organize society based upon the idea of the self and that the self is the highest God and highest authority. And, and this is causing all the problems that we're, we're now watching in real time in the West. Where, where even left-wing ideas are now cannibalizing one another and feminists are fighting transgenders and, you know, the, the, the BLM movement is advocating apartheid between races because of this madness of disunity. the self. Yeah. And a lot of disunity because we've got, we haven't got a common narrative to bind us. Yeah? And, and, and the, the, the narrative that was binding us before was national identity and the narrative that was binding us before that was religion. Right, but but the, the the kind of national identity we we've seen the horrors that that creates, you know, colonialism, um, World War One, World War Two, that that kind of national identity is clearly bringing out the worst in us. Whereas whereas Christianity took barbarians in Western Europe. You know, and obviously there's different Christian stories in Ethiopia and Armenia, but they essentially follow the same pattern. That they took barbarians and they turned them into a civilization. A civilization that produced beautiful art, beautiful music, beautiful architecture. The idea of, that, that, that bought into the idea of a common humanity, which is, which is unique to Christian doctrine. I get that, you know, I, I also listened to your speech about how you know, Christianity is not, it's the only religion which actually unites everyone, no matter your race, creed, yeah, gender, whatever. Yeah, exactly. And that's, you know, the message is beautiful. So what's stopping you like, embracing it for yourself? You know, I'm, I'm not trying to say that the people who, who proclaim they're Christians and do bad acts, I just think there's just too many of them. When I look, when I look in the past, like, all the atrocious things. Yeah. Christians but that was not no so what happened there was another example of Christians play putting their Christian faith as secondary to national identity yeah. all the examples that you will point to as bad examples right in modern times certainly they're all examples of where Christians have compromised on their Christian identity and I'm not calling you to be that kind of disciple sure. uh, being a disciple of our Lord Jesus Christ means that you give everything to Jesus I feel like institutionally, we've got like, Christian institutions have compromised so much already. You know, like yeah. the Church of England yeah. accepting gay marriages, yeah. gay free. 
Uh, well, they haven't accepted gay marriage officially. Right. Well, what have they accepted? Then? Something about civil They've got a lot of gay priests who are living in um, committed relationships um, that are active homosexuals. That's been accepted. But it's not been accepted. But gay marriage is, is not officially within the teachings of the Church of England. But what I would say a couple of things about that is one. The Christian world and the Church of England are not equivalents. The Christian world is bigger than the Church of England. Two, the vast majority of Christians condemn the Church of England for its compromises. Three, following Jesus doesn't mean following the Church of England. I'm not calling you to follow the Church of England. I'm calling you to follow Jesus. The simple message of the Christian faith is become a disciple of Jesus Christ. That's a simple message we say to everybody. Because, so so that, back to applied ethics, though. Well, you said you wanted to discuss abortion. Well, um, yeah, no, well, no, 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 no. I want to discuss you, actually. What, what, what stops you from becoming a disciple of Jesus? Why, why are you not... What are you ready to say, I'm going to become a Christian today? What, what, what stops you from making that comment? For me, it's like... Problems when I see... I just... The society I grew up in, very liberal, yeah. like, free society. But what's that got to do with Jesus? I just sometimes feel that the moral teachings of Jesus and the Bible as a whole might not be best applicable to this, to this in the day and age we live in right Give now. Give me an example. Abortion is a great example. Uh, right. So, so what, 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 is your, what is your objection to Christians believing that all life it begins at conception? I just object to the fact that sometimes we got to give the woman more autonomy. Because, you know, it's the church's position, even the Russian Orthodox church recently said you know even a woman is raped you know abortion will be murder she's never permissible to be like yeah you know which is true it would and be. i respect them for you know sticking to their values i just don't think we can live in a society which can promote that as the message you but know, i think like, i think what you're looking for is something that everyone will accept I, uh, that's not what being a christian is about being a christian is about following jesus even if people don't accept that because society is committing a crime when it aborts the unborn. It's killing children. But is society not committing a crime to the woman who was raped and we refuse her her abortion? No, we're not. <laughs> no, definitely not. It would be a crime if we didn't counsel and support the victims of rape. Sure. It would be a crime if we said to the woman, you have to raise that child. Those would be crimes. But if we say to the woman, look, you've been the victim of a crime, but we're not going to make one crime uh, replaced by another crime. So, what, what, so yeah, exactly, two wrongs don't make a right. So what we're going to do is, if you want to keep your child, we're going to support you. If you don't want to keep your child, we're going to take your child away from you and still support you as the victim of rape. And then give the child to a, a, a childless couple who want to have that baby. Do you, I, I'm just Would curious. you agree that the child is innocent of the rape? The child is completely innocent. So where is the justice in killing the child because of rape? You know, I'm, I'm not saying there's, there's a the best, there's a just answer. I'm there is saying, a just answer. No, but that's, no there that, is a just that's answer. A, that's a matter of faith in a, in, a, in a way, right? Well, no, no, it's based upon, if you agree with the premises, the logic, the conclusion becomes logical. If you agree that what is growing inside a woman's womb is a human being, then the, the, the conclusion is that both human beings have to be protected. And if the woman is the victim of rape, she has to be supported and counselled because she is a victim of rape. But the child should not be punished because of what the father did. Yeah, Bear in mind, that child is still half hers. I get that, but for me, I just feel like where you're comparing the child and the woman as one and one. You know, for me, it's more like one and... 0.1, maybe. On what grounds do you say it's not a full human being? Like, you know the whole like Muslim view that even you know it's okay before like the third or first trimester because that's when they get the central nervous system and, and things like that. It's because of the heartbeat. Or the heartbeat, which like, they believe is a view like that is a bit is plausible. I just think you no, know, from conception. But on what basis do you, you say right? So uh, a human, so they believe about ensoulment. The human heart starts to beat. 
right? And from then, that, you know, they can't yeah. afford. So, on what basis can you say that the day before that, we're not talking about a human being, no, I'm not and the day after, we arbitrary. are talking about it, a human being? arbitrary. Right, but, but that's the but point. The Christian view is arbitrary. Well. No, you know, no, hold on, hold on one second. Hold on one second. There's, there's nothing arbitrary about our stance. Because from the moment that the embryo is fertilized, it be the cells begin to separate. Okay. So that means that we're talking about something that is growing. Now, what is growing? Is it going to grow into a plant? No. Is it going to grow into a lovely kitten? No. What is it going to grow into? A human being. So what are we talking about? An embryo. <laughs> do, do, now, you see, that, 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 that recategorization right. is completely arbitrary from you. That embryo is human. It's not an embryo of anything else. But then I guess the question is how do you, what, what's a person to you? Like what's the criteria for a person? What's a human being? Nah, because you're changing the language now because we know no, no, that no, a human no, being is a human person. Being. Right. A human being is someone who has the genetics of a human being. Now am I wrong to say a fertilized egg has the genetics of a human being? To be honest, biologically I'm not too sure. Maybe it develops later or is it? Is I, I, I promise you I'm not wrong. Okay, yeah, yeah, all right, all right. I'm not wrong. Yeah, okay. So, so, if I'm, human, so if it's genetically a human being and that's my definition of a human being, then, then I'm being completely consistent from beginning to end. But if you're saying that at some arbitrary point we define this as living and at an arbitrary point we say that, it is, that it's not a human being, that's a complete human construct that's separated from reality the physical reality of a growing embryo. I get that. So our faith is grounded in physical reality. Those that oppose abortion are, are, are making arbitrary statements based on human ideology. So our position is in line with what God is doing. Islam and everyone else is in opposition to God, who, oppose, who stand against that. Now, I, I noted something when we were talking, that, that what you said is you want to find something that everyone can accept. No, no, no. I want to find something which... How about the truth? Yeah, I, I'm here to find the truth. Great. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm saying that, that Jesus is that truth, bro. Like, and, and, and my question to you is, what, uh, what stops you following Jesus? You said it's because his teachings can't be applied today. But if Jesus is the truth, then that means his, his teachings should be applied and those ideologies that, that oppose that are opposing the truth. What gives you so much conviction to say that Jesus is the truth? Uh, for me personally, I, I have had experiences, personal subjective experiences that are no evidence to you, but they are profoundly evident to me of the truth of my faith. God has spoken to me, God has answered my prayers, God has uh, revealed himself to me in a very profound and deep way. Now I accept that's no evidence to you and I'm not proposing that it is, you know. But in, in, in actual objective evidence, we have the resurrection. We have the fact that, you know, and, and that's a historical proof. We have the fact that the writers, the, the Bronze Age prophets that wrote the Bible were, were able to, to talk in such a way that their teachings were paralleling realities that they could not have possibly known about. And I'll give you three examples. All human beings come from the same origin. There's no reason why Bronze Age man should have come to that conclusion. By that you mean like Adam and Eve? As in, as in a, a, a proto-human society. I don't believe in a literal reading of Genesis, okay. but I do believe that Genesis is, is talking about something that we know to be true, that there were original humans. Now, they... Genesis, yeah, Genesis was written in the Bronze Age. There was no way these prophets could have known that. Another example, the idea that all the Earth's continents were once bound together is something that's in the scriptures, but there's no reason for Bronze Age man to have known that. The idea that light came before the sun, something that lots of ignorant people mock the Bible for, but they're only mocking their own ignorance because actually the Bible is correct. Light did come before the sun. I mean, but then in the Bible, the word came before anything, and how can you prove that? The, the, well, it's, but this is the point. The Christian faith d doesn't rely on, like, 100% proof. No, I, I'm not denying that. I just think, like, let, let, faith. Go on. For you, obviously, you've had personal experiences of God, and yeah. that's given you conviction. But at the end of the day, believing in a religion is about faith. And, 
perhaps I just haven't been. Right. So I want to I want to I want to give you the proper analogy to faith. The analogy to faith that is most accurate to faith in Jesus Christ is the idea of getting married. Because when you choose to get married to someone, you don't know everything about them. You don't know what they're going to be like in 20 years. You, you know something of them. And you know enough of them to think, I want to spend the rest of my life with that person. If you know enough about Jesus that you think to yourself, I want to spend the rest of my life as his disciple, then you know enough to be the disciple of Jesus. Sure. Because that's actually what faith is. That's the more approach. So we operate by faith all the time. Like you, you, you choose jobs on faith. You choose to move house on faith. You choose your life partner on faith. You, you make lots of choices in life based on faith, not an empirical evidence. So you operate by faith. So when the Christian faith, when the Christian religion calls you to operate by faith, we're actually asking you to do something that is very human. I'll debate you later. That's what they do. So, That's so what they you'll just have to focus on me. Just have to focus on me. Yeah. So you've got to, you've got to do you, operating on faith is something that is fundamentally human. Right. So now that's what I'm asking you to do with Jesus. If you know enough about Jesus to go, this guy is worthy of me being his student. I can agree to that much, you know. Right, I'm, I'm not, I'm not saying he's a bad man. I'm just saying some of the claims he makes what, what was their is like very, what was you know, their big crime? claims. And what if was their I'm wrong crime? in believing that his claim, if I'm wrong in believing he, he's right, crime? it could have really bad consequences for me as well, you know. You murdered so thousands more... of native Canadians. Why? Why? Because like, obviously, you know, Why? Christians believe that Jesus is so God and the whole Trinity view. Yes? Like, it, it's That's plausible to me. Teachers, I can yes? see how Christians Killers. believe in it and, and have, you're gonna have to speak it's true. But for me, it's like it is still such a fat claim, and I just can't fully get my head around it. For a Christian, is is it's like the Trinity, like a very solid concept. Well, even with that, there's a bit of like just faith when you boil it down. No, the 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 Trinity is based upon our understanding of the Bible. Because anyone who reads the Bible sincerely sees the Trinity all the way through the Scripture. So, because we see the Scripture as an authority, we, we, we take its teaching seriously. And, and this is the thing, if you, if you see in Jesus that which you say, I want him to be my teacher, not Muhammad. I want him to be my teacher, not Buddha. I want him to be my teacher, not Douglas Murray. I want him to be my teacher, not Jordan Peterson. I want him to be, if you see enough in Jesus that you want to be a student, then you've got to take everything that he says seriously. So when he calls himself the son of the father and claims that you, that, that you must honor him as you honor the father and says that he is the first and the last, then that means that he has given himself an equality with God and a divinity that we can't ignore. Because if he is our teacher, then we have to take everything that he says seriously, you know? And, and when he says that the paraclete... Yeah? It's a bit too good to be true. Like how is it that God, you know, literally came down as man because he really loved us and because he just wanted to... Why, why is that too good to be true? Is it like... Isn't that the most? But isn't that a beautiful vision of God? Yeah, that's. But we're not Muslims. Yeah, I'm not Muslim. You're not Muslim. So why use Muslim language? So my 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 point about Muslims and Islam is that their view of God, their view of God. I mean, you can see the behaviour of Muslims right now. So they have a they have a God of power. Their vision of God is a God of power. And that's why they behave like this, the because their theology the esteems kill. power the over Christians everything kill. else. Murderers. Our vision of God is a God of love, of God. which is why You're as Christians, when they bombed our cathedrals in Iraq, our response was to build hospitals. You are liar. You are liar. When they, when they bombed our churches Who in Pakistan, our response was to build Iraq? schools. So, so these are the realities that we've got to tune into. Like, the, the vision of God that Indians? Islam has is a confused God. No. It's a f confused God 
And so when they say things like benefits, benefit, you know, does it, does it, is it, is it befitting of God to become a man? It's because the vision of God that they have is a God of power who is remote and distant, who doesn't speak to us. He only sends delegates. But our vision of God is that God loves you so much that he not only sent delegates, but he is willing to be present personally with you in the Holy Spirit, which we receive when we accept Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ himself became a human being. Yeah. JC, let's just move over to the fence. Yeah. Just, just follow me a second. You what? Yeah, baptism is fundamentally important. Like Christ commands that we should be baptized. You know, and so it, it's not an option for us. Again, it's this thing. If you take Jesus as your teacher, then you have to take seriously everything that Jesus says. And Jesus says, you should be baptized. So we have to be baptized, you know? So, so my question to you is, bro, who do you think Jesus is? Um, gosh, I, I, that's the thing, I don't know. Um, even, even though I, I, I studied uh, philosophy, religion, and ethics at, uh, at uni, I studied the history of Christianity. Yeah. And I've you know, seen like, all of the different historical accounts we have of Jesus. And so I'm not really denying that he existed. I'm just saying that, like, you know, you, you sort of have to look at historical facts in the same vein as, like, it's not a mathematical fact, do you know what I mean? Like, I can't put the same amount of that faith in a historical statement like, or an artifact as I can with, like, logic. Yeah, well, so work with me logically. Would you agree that the earliest Christians were convinced that Jesus Christ was the Messiah? Like the apostles and stuff? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Right. So, the Messiah, if you know your Old Testament, the Messiah is a divine figure. So if the earliest apostles said that the Messiah, that Jesus is the Messiah, they're saying that Jesus is divine. Messiah means messenger, right? No, it means anointed. Oh, okay. Right? But if you look at if you look at the Messiah in the Old Testament, and I'll give you some examples right now, right? He has to be a divine figure, he can't just be a man. So I'll, I'll use one example that was accepted in Jesus' time as being a prophecy of the Messiah. Psalm 110. And it says, The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion, saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will volunteer freely in the day of your power, in holy array from the womb of the dawn. Your youth are to you as the dew. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are, pr you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Now for him to be a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek, bearing in mind that this is the psalmist speaking, this is David's psalmist speaking, the psalm of David, and he's addressed, he says, Yahweh says to my Adonai. So that means the Adonai is present at the time of David, which is before Jesus Christ. Yeah? yeah, And it says that the Adonai will rule in the midst of his enemies, just like the church is Christ's sovereign rule in the midst of all those that persecute her. That his kingdom will go out from... Yeah, yeah. So, so that's been fulfilled in your hearing. You, you are alive to this reality because the church is where Christ rules and the church is surrounded by her enemies. So Christ is ruling in the midst of his enemies. And it says that he, the Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion. The church grew and spread from Jerusalem. So that's fulfilled again. And it also says that he will be a priest in the order. He will be a priest forever in the order, according to the order of Melchizedek. Which means that this isn't just a man. So when the first apostle said, and you agreed, that they said that Jesus is the Messiah. Well, I've just shown you... And then they had the, the bloody luck of luck to see him resurrect. I, I did not. And, and Christ said, blessed are those who believe without seeing. You know? <laughs> because Thomas didn't see Christ resurrect initially, and he didn't believe. He still only doubted three times and got he, hung upside he, down. He, he, no. That's Peter. He did, yeah, Peter got hung upside <laughs> down. And, and he renounced Christ three times. 
I mean, are you from a Christian background? What's yeah, your background? I mean, actually, my, my dad is a Methodist minister. Um, um, I'll, I'll just, yeah. You know, he never baptized me. He, yeah. He's like, been actually really, really free in letting me like choose how far I want to choose. Yeah. Um, I'm. I, what I'm. I, you know, I've done my whole life. I grew up in a church. Yeah. Just, I, I haven't had this calling, sense of calling that you know my brother or my or like other Christians that I am friends with have had. Brother, you you are having this sense of calling because you're here talking to me. I'm you're here, here looking for the truth. Sure. So if you're here looking for the truth, that's because the Holy Spirit is working in your heart. And you said that you're close. And what I'm saying to you is that don't allow the compromises and the weaknesses that you see in the Methodist Church and in the Anglican Church put you off following Jesus. I'm not calling you to be an Anglican. I'm not calling you to be a Methodist. I'm not calling you to be a Roman Catholic. I'm not calling you to be an Orthodox. I'm not calling you to be uh, a Baptist or a Presbyterian. I am simply and only calling you to be a student of Jesus Christ. It, it had the most profound impact like, on my life. When you, when, you, when you describe Christianity just merely as a student, in sort of those terms, I can accept it. But then, so accept when it. You, when you, I, I said I can accept that Jesus is a great teacher. So do you want him to be your teacher? <laughs> Because this is what it boils down to. It's just there are like so many metaphysical claims and things which surround. But these the things, religion. these things, these metaphysical claims, I believe stand up to scrutiny. Christianity has withstood centuries of criticism and scrutiny. 300 in the Enlightenment in Europe, 1400 in the Middle East. Christians have been uh, 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 jostled and forced to defend their faith. And we can defend our faith very rigorously because our, our, our faith does not contradict rationality or reason, unlike Islamic theology. But Christian theology doesn't contradict rationality or reason. So, for instance, no, not really. I, 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 I wouldn't I know say you're, so. You know, you have your very strong, and I respect that. You know, so for instance, this idea, you know, one can't be three and three can't be one. Right, you've heard that, I'm sure. Yeah, do, do, you, do you think that there's any sense to that argument? I don't know, you know or do you dismiss when, when that you, like I do? Like, when you just see it, when, you, when someone says that, you know, instinctively you might think, yeah. But then I've also heard the sort of examples you've given about three-dimensional space. Yeah, or... and those are th examples of plurality and singularity. So there's nothing illogical about the idea of plurality and singularity. It's a completely rational concept. It's also, a, incidentally, a mathematical concept. It's also, incidentally, a physical reality. So there's nothing, in, there's nothing in, uh, inconsistent to this idea of plurality and singularity. Trinity, right? I really, really wish that in the New Testament there was some like, just quite fairly explicit verse somewhere about the Trinity. There are. What's your best one? Could you, I, I actually really want to... Yeah, so, so for example, in the end of Matthew, Christ says, that all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth and go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, let's do a quick Bible study. <laughs> yeah, but I, I know this. Let, let, I know this right, so let, let's, do a, let's do a quick Bible study. Who's the Father? God. Right. Is there anyone that can be equal to God? No. 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 Yeah. Right. So if someone is listed as being equal to God, what must that mean about that person? All authority is given to me in heaven, and go therefore and make this public nation that says in the name of the Father. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yep. How does that equate to them being equated? Great, great question. Right. So, if you, you, to use in a modern day analogy, if a police officer says, stop in the name of the law, what he's doing is he's appealing to the authority of the law to command you to do something. Right? Yeah. So when Christ says, baptize in the name of the Father, so that, that, that immediately we're talking about God. And we're talking about God's name as being singular. But then it says, and of the Son. Now who's the Son according to the Bible? Jesus Christ. So that means that in the name of the Father and of the Son, well, God can't be brought down in terms of equality. So the Son has to be lifted up in terms of equality. Do you see how that works? So the Son, is now as divine as the Father, equal in authority as the Father, because it's an initiation rite of baptism. Yeah? You know baptism is an initiation rite? So it's bringing you in, it's like the Queen making you a knight. Yeah? So then it says, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. 
So now we've got an equality between Father, Son and Holy Spirit. But God's equality, God's dignity, God's authority is singular. So that means the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit all have it at the same time. And that means that that's a Trinitarian passage right there. Yeah. I get that. But then is a claim there then that like, is a claim that you're making that with God like you know God has always existed in this sort of tri 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 God has always existed as the triad. Always. And you see the plurality in the Old Testament. Do you want me to show you the plurality in the Old Testament? Like, oh, plural, plurality. Plural God. The plurality of God in the Old Testament. Okay, so let me. Sh I'll show you two passages in the Old Testament. Okay. Right. One second. Let's step away. Let's step this way. With. Okay. Right. Let me read you a passage. Listen to me, O Jacob, even Israel, whom I called. I am He. I am the first, and I am also the last. Surely my hand founded the earth, and my right hand spread out the heavens. Who's talking here? God. When I call to them, they stand together. Assemble all you and listen. Who among them has declared these things? The Lord loves him. He will carry out his good pleasure on Babylon. So he's talking about Cyrus there. And his arm will be against the Chaldeans. I even I have spoken indeed I have called him I have brought him and he will make his way successful come near to me listen to this from the first I have not spoken in secret who's speaking there God so God is still talking now listen to what comes next from the time it took place I was there and now the Lord God has sent me and his spirit so God was speaking, but God said that the Lord God has sent him. And he's not just sent him alone, he sent him with his spirit. Okay, I see that. Yeah. So let me let, 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 let me show you another example of it. In Genesis chapter 18. Okay. So say I'm convinced that even in the Old Testament God is plurality, plurality and singularity. Plurality of you. Yeah. What's the theological reason for that? Because that, that is, it's, it's just capturing the reality of who God is. There's not, it's, not like, it's not like a man's invention. It's that God has basically... Um, in a way, it is man's invention. No. It's the, it, this is the only way we can possibly sort of conceive of him. But like, you know, his, his rule... It's, 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 it's like you saying what you see. Yeah. It, it's your words, but the reality is outside of yeah. you. I'm just saying it's the limit of our language. Yes. Our, our knowledge to, of him is the limit of I, I, I would agree that. I would agree that, yes. So, the, the, but, but that's what the Bible is. It's not like someone's gone, you know what, I think it's a good idea. We'll put plurality and singularity here. It's that they experience and see plurality and singularity and then put that because they see it. Does that make sense? Let me show you another passage of the same kind of plurality and singularity. Yeah, in Genesis chapter 18. Okay. Now the Lord appeared to him. Is that singular or plural? Singular. singular. The Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre, while he was sitting at the tent door in the heat of the day. When he lifted up his eyes and looked, behold, three men were standing opposite him. Is that plural or singular? But who who appeared to him? Three. Who, who, three men, but who appeared to him? Oh, the Lord, the Lord. And that is Yahweh. translated as Yahweh, capital, capital, capitalized. So now the Lord Yahweh, so Yahweh appeared to him by the... ready for this. <laughs> do you know what I'm saying, bro? Like what I'm saying to you is, you know, I, I know something about the Methodist church. And the Methodist church is a soy boy church, full of soy boys, you know, and, and, and guys that eat kimchi and drink... And, and drink and drink oat, oat, oat lattes, yeah. right? I'm not in calling you to that kind of wimpy, spineless Christianity. I'm calling you to a muscular Christian faith that is is a that, that commits itself to following Jesus wherever that leads. And if that leads into conflict, it leads into conflict. If it leads into opposition, it leads into opposition. It's a singular devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's what I'm inviting you to. The question is, are you, are you, do you have it in you that in the face of all the evidence to go, 
Look, I am going to give my life to Jesus. I am going to follow him. Are you ready? I don't have the courage in me to say. Because honestly, it's not that you haven't been persuading today. I'm just a very authentic, authentic. Like, I, 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 would, I don't want to lie to myself. Yeah. And so, like, if I have this, if I have a doubt in me. I don't want to rush into it. No, that's fine. And and I, I, I desperately don't want you to make a hasty emotional decision. I want you to make a head and a heart decision that is as, as committed in intellect as it is in passion. And when you're ready to do that, come and celebrate with me. All right? Actually, you've been very, it was a nice chat. Very nice chat. Yeah. I, I just want to finish up. in the um, Old Testament about the plurality, especially this one. I've never, yeah. literally never even seen that one. So, so Jen, I just want to finish this. Now Yahweh appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre while he was sitting at the tent door in the heat of the day. When he lifted up his eyes and looked, behold, three men were standing opposite him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and listen to what comes next and bowed himself to the earth and said, my Lord, singular. singular. He's identifying the three as Yahweh. This is Abraham. This is Abraham. So you see, you saw in Psalm 110, a, a prophecy of the Messiah that Jesus himself uses to refer to himself as the Messiah. That means that the Messiah has to be divine. You already know enough to know that the first Christians accepted Jesus as the Messiah. You see in uh, the book of Isaiah that God who founded and expanded the heavens and create, founded the earth is being sent by the Lord God with the Spirit of God. And Jesus, who is God, receives what is baptism? Uh, the, Holy the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of the Lord. And the Father speaks from heaven saying, this is my Son, the Beloved, in whom I am well pleased. So the Trinity is there in the Old and the New Testaments. It's logically consistent. But then why would the Jews disagree about the Old Testament? The first Jews, the first Jews were quite open to the idea of plurality and singularity. It's because of a reaction due to Christian persecution of the Jews and Christian missological efforts to the Jews that meant that the Jews closed down that idea within their own community because we were using that to make converts amongst the Jews. So as a way of defending their community from conversion to Christianity, they shut down that whole idea within their community. But you go and look, you go and research, first century Jews were quite open to the idea of plurality within the divinity. There's even a book, it's like when the rabbis believed in the Trinity. Go and Google it. Yeah? And come back, I hope one day, bro, you're going to come back and tell me I've decided to follow Jesus. Remember, I'm not inviting you to become a Methodist soy boy. I'm not inviting you to become an apostate, Anglican, compromised Nisbet. I'm inviting you to follow Jesus, heart, mind and soul, and take seriously what he teaches. All right, I want to give you a, a gift, bro. I give everybody a gift. Yeah, I give everybody a gift. 15 ways for more effective prayer. Don't mind the cover, it's a crappy cover, but that's because it's probably self-published. So it's just a gift. Have a read of it. When did you become a Christian? I became a Christian when a Muslim tried to convert me to Islam. So he tried to convert me. My whole life, man. What? Obviously, like, growing up in a very moral culture school. Yeah. It's, you know, I live in the sort of age where people my kids my age, they're more, if they're Muslim, they're more proud than Christians are about their faith. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so, none of my Christian, faith, Christian friends were like going to sort of evangelize me, but all my Muslim friends are trying to convert me. Yeah, but, but the point is, bro, it's about what you believe about Jesus. You see, Christians and Muslims can't both be right about Jesus. But would you agree with me that the evidence for the crucifixion is insurmountable? Crucifixion, yeah. Right, so that means that Islam teaches something that we know to be false, because Islam says Christ wasn't crucified. Sure, I mean, there's a reason why it didn't work on me. Yeah, but, but what I'm saying is, if our faith corresponds with morality and rationality and history, then, then what reason do we have to object to it following it? It doesn't correspond with my sense of morality at the moment. Well, I would. It's more that I would have to bend my back to it. I, and, and I would, I would agree. To become a Christian, everyone needs to change to conform to the image of Christ. Yeah. And I have no shame in saying that if you become a disciple of Jesus, you're saying you know better than me, so I follow what you teach.
That is definitely what it is to be a Christian. I hope you do get a motion today. today. I'll be I'm, I'm, I'm going to go and look into one. Have a good day. God bless. Okay, so in wrap up, God bless you, bro. So the brother is sincere, he's a genuine guy, he's very close to the Christian faith. And the essential essence of the Christian message, the single essence of the Christian message, is to become a disciple of Jesus. And so I want to ask each and every one of you who watches this, who do you think Jesus is? What, who do you think Jesus Christ is? He's clearly more than a prophet. He claimed to be more than a prophet. He was crucified and his earliest followers were convinced that he rose from the dead. And if you, like me, acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, then you owe it to yourself to make him your teacher and to become his disciple. That's the simple message of Christianity. It's not complicated, it's not difficult. It's, do you believe in Jesus Christ as the Messiah? So follow him. So no, I, I'd like to talk to you. Now you heckled me. I don't, I don't, I don't want to. No, 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 you heckled me. I want to talk to you. What, what about, what about, what about, what about, what about, what about the Muslims who invaded other people's lands and enslaved them by the millions?